Welcome back to page 121. Today we're going to answer the question, how are your travelers traveling? When you start out a campaign, one of the early decisions you have to make is how your travelers are going to be moving about. Are they going to have access to something they got mustering out, like a lab ship? Or a Beowulf class free trader? I don't know. Maybe a far trader. Or maybe the ever-popular Scout Courier. They could also end up with a safari ship or a yacht. Don't have deck plans for them. I probably do somewhere. Uh, but the point of the video today is for you as a player, or as the GM rather, to decide how your travelers are going to be traveling. Are they going to have a ship benefit mustering out? Which, by the way, is often decided by the dice, not by you as the, the GM. Or are they going to have to find some other means? Perhaps crewing a ship or buying passage on a ship. So today we're going to take a look, a look at a couple of different ways you can solve this conundrum early on. And we're going to take most of our information out of the Core 22, 22 rulebook update. Yay, my old friend here. Uh, because this is the book that I'm basing my travel campaign out of. One thing I love about this book is you can literally run an entire campaign just out of this one guy. So today, your traveler's getting there. I also want to remind everybody I'm doing a push for subscribers. So if you can help me out, I would appreciate it. I'm really trying, uh, as I end up the month, beginning the new month, to get a bunch of uh, new subscribers to get the channel and help it grow. So if you can help me out, that'd be great. I also have a Patreon. Please remember that. But today, how are your travelers getting there? Traveling in Traveler. How the travelers are traveling. That's a very important decision for you to make as the GM. You have to make it pretty early in the campaign. You have to decide first if they are traveling. Maybe you're going to do a campaign where they're planet-bound for the entire campaign, or at least the early leg of the campaign. So you've decided you don't have to worry about a starship. It's, it's just going to be something that will come up later. Almost every traveler campaign I've done has started out in some way with or board a starship. I just concluded a, a rather lengthy intro to my campaign. Uh, we were able to com conclude it a, a few days ago, where the players had... Uh, one of the players had gotten a scout ship as a mustering out benefit and had to go to the planet Motmos in District 268 to pick up the starship. Uh, once on his way there, he encountered a couple of old friends, which were the other players in the group, and the three of them decided to go to Motmos, get on their buddy's newly acquired 100-ton displacement uh, scout ship, and off they would go to seek their glory in their future. They haven't really decided what they want to do yet. So for this campaign, what it started out was the idea that they would have a hard time physically getting the ship. Once the ship was down, uh, and internal, the planet Motmos is not an Imperial world. It is uh, an Imperial protectorate, but it's not actually in the Imperium. And once they were down and waiting for their ship, a uh, revolution broke out between revolutionaries and the established government. So the bulk of the game, there were the players getting across the rather large starport to claim their ship. Not only did they have to claim their ship from the scout service and all the paperwork, but they had to actually go under heavy fire and claim their ship. It was a lot of fun. It ended up, I thought it would be a one-nighter, it ended up being a three-nighter. And uh, a lot of role-playing in there in the early go and a lot of combat in the tail end. So that was how I introduced the ship, the scout player character, got the ship as a mustering out benefit, so I just ran with it. So we're going to take a look at what you can get mustering out as far as uh, ship benefits. I'm going to explain the, the various benefits, and then we're going to see, uh, give ideas of what you might want to do or not do in your campaign. So we go to the handy-dandy traveler creation section, since that's always important, and we're going to start with, I'm just going to go through each and see who gets a, an option to ship share or a ship or anything like that. So we get the agent who has a ship share as one of their mustering out benefits. <clears throat> Nothing for the army. That makes perfect sense. Here we go. Citizen, two ship shares is a possibility. That's interesting. And then a ship share up there as well. A drifter could get a ship share or two ship shares. Here we go. Two ship shares again for the entertainer. And I'm going to explain what a ship share is in just a moment. Uh, nothing for the Marine. The Merchant can get ship shares or a free trader. That's a great benefit if you roll it. The Navy, you can get 
personal vehicle or a ship share. Ship's boat or two ship shares. I've never seen anybody, by the way, take a ship's boat. Uh, that's been offered for a while in different versions of Traveler. I've never seen anybody take it. All you could do that with that really is just kind of a low-grade taxi service. For a noble, you can get two ship shares, a ship share, two ship shares, or a yacht. So we're getting into some good stuff here. For a rogue, you can have a ship share, or two die ship, one die ship shares, or two die ship shares. That's a pretty big deal. And then here you can have two ship shares as a scholar or a chance at a lab ship. And as a scout, of course, a ship share or a scout ship. And since my one player rolled it legitimately as a mustering out benefit, he got the uh, 100 ton displacement scout ship. Uh, and they're very happy with it. So going to... Uh, the various, what these things mean, what a ship share means. Okay, first off, we're going to go down, we'll just take this alphabetically. We'll go to the free trader. You receive a free trader with 25% of the mortgage paid off. This free trader is identical to the one on page 194, but you must roll one die times for spacecraft quirks table. So it may have some quirks. Maybe it just needs a good tune-up. Maybe the computer needs a good overhaul or upgrade. Uh, some things that you want to put in your traveler's paths a little bit, but you don't want to break their backs with it. If you roll the benefit a second time, an additional 20% of the 25% of the mortgage is paid off. If you roll this benefit four times, the free trader will have no mortgage at all and be yours. Ultimately, you may select a far trader. So that's kind of neat. You can ch choose either one. Uh, far trader has better jump, uh, which is tempting, but it's more expensive to operate. So you come to a lab ship. And a lab ship, 25% of the mortgage paid off. And then, again, you have to roll for quirks. And if you get this four times, the ship is yours for free. Scout ship. You receive a scout ship. You have full use of the ship. You can modify it as you see fit. But it still belongs to the scout service and can and will be recalled back into service as needed. This means you will be expected to complete missions for the scout service from time to time. If you roll this benefit more than once, re-roll the result. So the scout ship is, is pretty much the simplest way. The players get use of the scout ship free and clear. They can modify it pretty much however they want. And uh, it's adding a weapon, upgrading the computer system, things like that. You can go ahead and do that, but you got to remember that whatever improvements you attach to the ship become the scout services if they ever need to recall the ship. A ship like this would only be recalled from uh, inactive service to active service pretty much in a time of a local war or something like the rebellion outbreak. They would recall all the scout ships. And it's important to remember, too, that you are on detached service, basically. You're part of the scout reserve. As such, if the scouts need a message brought from here to there, or they need a passenger shuttled somewhere, guess who's doing it? And they really don't care about your timetable or what other things you might have had in the fire. You're, you're doing it. That's the deal. So now we get to ship shares. You obtain one or more ship shares that can be put towards obtaining a ship. Each share is worth a million credits, but cannot be redeemed for cash. So we go, well, wait a minute, okay, how does this work with the ship shares? Well, as you saw, there were multiple ship shares. There are multiple opportunities for ship shares. Each of these is worth, in value in a ship, roughly a million credits, but you cannot redeem this for cash. They represent contacts, credit ratings, savings, and favors owed to the traveler can be put toward ownership of a space vessel worth roughly one million credits. Travelers can pool their ship shares toward the use of a vessel, but they cannot trade ship shares. You can't give them to one guy. Shares, uh, and they cannot use them, uh, trade them for cash. It's unlikely that travelers will be able to own anything but the smallest starship outright at the start of the game, so most crews end up working to support a mortgage for their spacecraft. The more ship shares that a group of travelers can put together, the bigger a ship they can afford. And then you see spaceship operations for how ships' mortgages and ship shares can be applied against them. I asked my players early on in... We didn't do it session zero, but you know when I asked them about starting up the travel campaign and the direction they wanted to take it, one of the first things I asked them was, are we going to be a merchant ship where you're, you're paying off a mortgage? And every one of them said, no, we worry about mortgages all the time. We worry about bills all the time. That's not why I role play. I don't want to have that as my thing. Now, I have played in merchant games. They can be a ton of fun. It, you have to kind of step away and, and realize it's fantasy, not reality, and you can't really equate it to your daily life. But it, it's, it can be immersive in its own. It doesn't have to be part of the daily angst of paying your bills. That being said, I respected their wishes. So one of my players wanted to be a scout anyway. 
So even if he hadn't rolled the scout ship, probably I would have given him the scout ship in place of one of his benefits anyway. That was the direction they kind of wanted to take the campaign. That in no way precludes them from buying a, a merchant ship down the line or getting ship shares as their characters go forward. So just an interesting way that our campaign started out, and it was based entirely on what they wanted and didn't want to do with their characters. So now we're going to common spacecraft. Uh, these are uh, just a quick look. There's the Scout Courier. I showed this when I reviewed this book. So here you have the Scout Courier. You've got all the stats for it. You've got the nice deck plan for it. I did a video on the Scout Courier deck plan from GURPS not too long ago. Uh, that's the one I'm using in my campaign. Uh, it's the one I showed at the open also. And then we've got the Seeker Mining Ship. 100 ton displacement. We've got the Free Trader, which is pretty sweet. And then we've got the Far Trader with its wonderful Jump 2 plant. I love the Far Trader. One of my best campaigns that I was ever part of as a player, or as a GM for that matter. Uh, we were uh, part of a crew aboard a Far Trader. It was a fun game. And there's the famous Safari Ship. You don't want a system defense boat. That would be boring. Although you could do a mercenary campaign where you uh, are running an STB as part of a mercenary contract. And then, of course, we have the ever-popular yacht. Yachts can be pretty neat. Uh, I've never run a game involving a yacht. Uh, it is an encounter, but never in a campaign. <clears throat> Just kind of interesting way to do it. So when looking to buy your ship outright, you're going to take on a mortgage. And as they say here, they are eye-wateringly expensive. So to take a look at what's expensive, say you want that far trader with that wonderful jump to drive. Your purchase price, base purchase price is 53 million credits and change. That's a staggering amount of money. Oh, I've got four ship shares. Congratulations. You've knocked it down to 49 million and change. So the ship shares end up not being that great against something that expensive, but they do help. What helps better is the 25% off the original mortgage. So that means it's an older ship, and you can use the rule that for every 25% off the mortgage, you add 10 years to the ship. Eh. Uh, but what you can do is reduce your mortgage payment or your mortgage time, depending on how you do it. It's the exact same way as buying a house. And then your ship shares, as I said, if I have uh, one player who's rolled two ship shares, he can apply the ship shares toward the mortgage and off of his 53 million credit purchase, he now only is mortgaging $51 million. So it's interesting. It could be a good way to do a down payment. Uh, you can pool them if you have, you know, a large group and you end up with, you know, 10 ship shares. Well, that's $10 million off the purchase price. That's pretty good. So it's interesting. Uh, my players right now just want to kind of get their, their toes in the water and just adventure. They don't want to worry too much about the financial end of it. So for the time being, I'm going ahead and I'm just uh, going past that part of it once they've got their, their scout ship. Once they start making a little bit of money at it and socking some money away, then I think they're going to be interested in, in, in upgrading the ship. So the career benefit, uh, as I said, if you get 25% ownership or even 50% of the ship share, then your mortgage is half or your time paying the mortgage is half. So it depends on how you want to do it. And then I've already discussed the ship shares and how those work. Nice ship layout for you to track everything. I love these forms. They did a nice job in this book. So that's the way your players can start out with a ship. A couple of different ways. Now, what if your players, nobody rolls any ship benefits whatsoever, which is entirely possible depending on the careers or just the luck of the dice. What do you do then? How do they travel? Well, there's a couple ways they could travel. They could crew aboard a far trader or a free trader. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, being paid to be a spacer, uh, a la Alien, where you're, you're getting your money for delivering your cargo. You sign a contract, you are paid X amount with a bonus for this or that. It's a good way to do it. It's a good campaign. The bad part of that is they're not self-deterministic. The players have to go where the person commanding the ship says they're going. can be good. It can free up your players and can let you drive the story entirely. I personally prefer the players to be the ones to direct the ship. So this isn't a way I've gone uh, to this point in Traveler. Uh, another way you can go is Working Passage, much the same situation as I just described, but they're, they're just copying worship, work, Working passage, passage to another point, maybe because they know somebody that's got a ship deal or something. 
Another way you can do it is they could be booking passage on some kind of liner where they're going to be middle class or if they must out well enough, high class passengers where they're just going to go and they're going to, they're going to have a vacation. And I've had adventures pop up while the travelers were taking a vacation. So there are ways to do that as well. Jump space is a wonderful equalizer uh, because everybody's trapped aboard the ship and now you've got to fight to survive. And if you're on a cruise and something goes wrong, you've still got to fight to survive. So that can be an interesting, interesting scenario too. Another way you can do it is the players can have a well-off merchant aunt or uncle who is looking to retire and hey, take over the ship for payments and is yours. Well, maybe the ship has already got 60% of the payments made. Maybe that's a way to entice a group that doesn't want to bother about mortgages and stuff into getting involved with a merchant ship that has a mortgage. So there's different ways that you can take a look at this and say, okay, what's going to work for my group? How are they going to like it? If they want action and adventure, you don't want to stick them on a lab ship. That's going to be more of a stop at one point and then adventures ensue from the lab ship. You could also incidentally have them crew a lab ship where the lab ship goes, where the university or government directs it, and then they just kind of babysit the scientists. Plenty of traveler adventures are written that way. I've run many traveler adventures like that. They can be great hooks, and it's a good way to get your travelers around if they have an event, uh, a lab ship. If you end up with a yacht, that writes itself. You could rent it out as a high-end kind of thing where you crew it, and uh, people pay you X amount for being aboard your yacht and enjoying the luxury of your vessel, or you're just living the life and, and just flying around in a yacht for some reason. Uh, my, my travelers would absolutely arm the yacht because that's how my travelers are. Uh, they, I gave them an armed uh, scout as the mustering out benefit simply because I knew them and I knew right away they'd want to put a laser on the thing, so I gave them a laser turret just because I didn't want that to be a stopper right out the gate. I know them. They were all happy that I gave it a laser. They're already talking about upgrading it, adding something else. So it, it was a good move on my part, but I, then I know my players pretty well. So these are just a few ideas of getting there. You, uh, the thing you have to decide then is going to be jump. How far do you want them to jump? Where that jump is going to take them? Where that's going to take you as a GM? If they get aboard a, a jump for luxury cruise uh, and they end up in the middle of a big clump of worlds, You've got to develop a lot of worlds all at once. Now, as you've been GMing, any worlds that are in their immediate path, you're going to be developing as they go. But you have to be aware of what they might do otherwise. So the Traveler map, fabulous resource in that regard. You pop the map up on your tablet or your TV. You look at it and you say, okay, if they go here, I have to worry about these two worlds. If they go here, I have to worry about these six worlds. With a jump four... There are places you could end up having to worry about 12, 15 worlds because that's those are the worlds they could be going to. Now you as the GM can route that jump for commercial uh, liner and put it where you want to put it. And if they don't get it back aboard it, well, that's up to them and then you're on the other planet. So there's a lot of ways you can direct that. If you've been following my how-to videos by now, you're going, hey, this guy manipulates his players. He directs where they're going to go and, and he kind of pens them in. Yes and no. It's always a GM's prerogative to go ahead and set up the geography to be to his liking. I do it in every game I play, whether it's D&D, Champion, Star Frontiers, Traveler, anything. I always set up the geography to fit my scenario or fit my scenario to the geography. So one and the other always go hand in hand. And it's not manipulating or, or bamboozling your players if you do it organically. I started them out in the world of Motmos, which had a jump one, only had one other world connecting. I only have one other world I have to worry about. We have a game coming up. I've got to develop that other world because I know they're going there. So there's not a ton of work in that regard. Now, when they make one or two more jumps, there is going to be a ton of work, but I can start shaping the story to take them to areas I want them to go. GMs always manipulate the action. They have to. It's their job. What I don't do and what I don't care for when I've been a player in games, and I've suffered this many times, is where the GM shoves it down your throat that you have to go here. You're in the dungeon. You can turn left, turn right, or go straight ahead. You decide to turn right. The GM says, no, you have to go left. That's where I've written the game. I've been in games like that. I've had that exact situation happen. I hate it. As far as I'm concerned, it's on me as the GM. If I prevent, present them with three different options, 
then I better be ready for any of the options the players choose. That is incumbent on the GM. It's part of what you do as a GM. So be ready for it. And it's not as daunting as it sounds because they're only going to make so many choices. In the example of Traveler, where I've got them on Motmos, they've only got one world to go to. And then after they leave that world, they jump to another and they have three worlds to go to. I can build it. And by building it, I can also shape my story so that they're going in areas that they and I both want them to go. Very often, I'll ask my players flat out, what are you planning for this campaign? What do you envision happening? That drives my story very often. I always want player input because, honestly, they're giving up their time. I want them to enjoy it. I put make it challenging. The firefight crossing the uh, starport to get to their scout ship was not something they anticipated. And they had a blast with it, but it was very challenging. Uh, so just, just some thoughts on traveling and for you travelers and uh, different ways you can accomplish it early and then just be ready for things that might come up later. So that's it for today on page 121, traveling for you travelers. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please like and subscribe. Still doing the big push for subscribers, so if you're on the fence, you know, please hop in. And uh, please remember the Patreon. Thank you for your time. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on page 121.